Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast Series. My name is Scott Miller and I serve as your host each week. By now you probably know I was privileged to also author a book based on the podcast called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds. HarperCollins has published this book for Franklin Covey, allowing me to kind of build the spotlight on many of our podcast guests. I curated 30 of our interviewees and shared a single transformative insight about each of them, sometimes on air, sometimes off air. Perhaps something they said before they hung up or before they, we showed them on video. I think you'll enjoy this book. It's fast, it's easy, it's breezy. It's available now in paperback copy. Would love to have you pick up a copy of Master Mentors. Our guest today is Jeff Woods. He is the acclaimed and renowned host of one of the world's most influential podcasts called The One Thing based on the book by the same name by authors Gary Keller and Jay Papazian. This book is a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller, a New York Times, a USA Today bestseller. It's also a number one Amazon bestseller. And the book is one of my favorite top 10 books of all time because of the methodology around goal setting. And today, Jeff Woods join us at, joins us as the co-founder and president of the firm behind the book to talk about all things goal setting, but not just in your professional life, but today, the art and the science of goal setting in our personal lives, with our families, our partners, our spouses. Jeff Woods, welcome to On Leadership. Scott, thanks for having me. Great to see you, man. Jeff, you and I have become swift friends over the past couple of years because of not just my passion for the book that you, are, of course, are out evangelizing for. It's two co-authors. We share the, the art and the humility that comes with hosting you know, large podcasts. Jeff, today we're going to talk about goal setting in our personal lives. Now, most of our episodes here on On Leadership focus on building leadership strength in our professional lives, but we all know that for those of us that are, our parents are uh, married, are dating someone perhaps in some kind of relationship, to quote you, that we're doing life with others, we also have goals in our personal lives. Just before we kind of dig into that, would you kind of reorient our guests and listeners around the world to your own journey, how you came to not just host the One Thing podcast, but for your passion around the power of it's not just setting, but achieving goals. I, like a lot of people, had a great job. Prior to co-founding this company with Gary Keller and Jay Papazan, I was in medical device sales, which was a great job. I woke every day running through hospitals, selling a device that actually saved lives. It's got deep down, I, I knew I was meant for more. I didn't know what it was, but I just knew one day I wanted to own a business that would make a massive impact in the world and deliver real security for my family. Problem was I had on some very comfy golden handcuffs. Two things happened that forced me to make a change. First, a colleague of mine had a stroke. And at the time he was 35 years old. My wife and I had just bought a house in Orange County. My wife just had her first child. She became a stay-at-home mom. And I remember standing in the kitchen, Scott, wondering, what would happen to my family if what happened to my colleague had happened to me? Yeah. That was incredibly unsettling. Mm -hmm. And then the next week, my company needed to make a change to our commission structure. They're a publicly traded company. It was the right move for the business. The problem was overnight, I lost 40% of my income. For any of you who have ever had a big pay cut or a devastating job loss, it can be crippling. And for me, I'm watching month after month as we are hemorrhaging cash, getting to the point where the bank account is literally almost at zero. I am looking at my wife, looking at my baby girl, wondering how am I going to put food on the table? That's when I was introduced to the Jim Rohn quote that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And while a lot of people listening to this have heard that quote, I did something that most people don't. I took out a pen and a piece of paper and actually wrote down the names of the five people I spent the most time with. Scott, when I looked at that list, I saw the names of five amazing friends. And that was the light bulb moment. I had five amazing friends. I had zero amazing mentors, which is why I love your book. That became my one thing at the time, to surround myself with people who are where I wanted to be. You fast forward, it's our national sales meeting. I walk into the ballroom and on every single chair was a copy of the one thing. Jay Papazan walked out on stage and for the next hour, he shared why the one thing is the surprisingly simple truth behind extraordinary results 
and how Gary Keller lived these principles to turn Keller Williams into the largest real estate company in the world. The whole time I'm in the audience, I'm wondering, how could I get a guy like Jay or Gary to be one of my five? And when he finished speaking, he gets this standing ovation, just like everybody does for you when you speak, Scott. But when everybody sat down, I found myself still standing. It was one of those moments where my mind was telling me to do one thing, but my heart was pulling me in this different direction. My mind was saying, Jeff, sit, but my heart was saying, go. And before you know it, I am literally sprinting down the ballroom. I intercept Jay, and that began a relationship. What I was unaware of was that the one thing had already become one of the highest rated business books of all time. And that created a problem because Gary Keller's one thing, running Keller Williams. Jay's one thing, writing books with Gary. They were looking for someone whose one thing would be the one thing. And that became my opportunity. So November 1st, 2015, moved my family from Southern California to Austin, Texas to start a company that would hopefully teach people how to better invest their time so they can achieve extraordinary results. I love that story. I never knew the history of that. There is so much replicable wisdom in that, right? Is decide what your one thing is and go after it, including if it means remaining standing in an audience of thousands of people who are sitting and beelining it to go make a connection for yourself, to go get a mentor. It's, a, it's such a great visceral example of empowering people to stay standing mm -hmm. and go after it. Jeff, uh, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, the book, The One Thing, if anybody follows my blog, they follow my ink column, they follow this podcast, they know that this is not a throwaway statement. This is one of my 10 all favorite books. In fact, my favorite page in the book I have memorized, it is page 150 that illustrates what you call goal setting to the now. Now in a couple of minutes, we're gonna pivot off of the professional conversation onto our personal lives, but this is, I think, perhaps the most powerful page ever illustrated in any book ever published. That is not an understatement. Go buy the book, The One Thing, for page 150 alone. I write about it in Master Mentors where I feature the co-author Jay Papazan. Would you, Jeff, take us through a couple of minute um, illustration of why page 150 is so valuable around goal setting sure. for the now, and we'll pivot over to the, the topic for today's uh, podcast interview. I remember sitting down with Jay and he asked me a question. He said, Jeff, do you know how billionaires set goals? And I said, no, but I sat down and grabbed my pen and paper as enthusiastically as possible. <laughs> and he said, you know, most people, when they set their goals, they set them looking forward. They imagine what they can accomplish over the course of the year. But the problem is they don't know what a true priority is from a distraction. Yeah, when we imagine our lives leading up to today, you think, okay, well, I got up this morning and before this, I joined my organization. And before that, I was in college. And before that, I grew up in this place. And when we imagine our lives looking backwards, it's a straight line. But when we look forward, we do not see a straight line. We see all the things we could do. And over the course of time, you could end up in a massively different destination. It's like if you and I, Scott, boarded a plane in Salt Lake City and we're going someplace cool, where do we wanna go? Cabo. Cabo. If we take off and a gust of wind hits the plane, blows it 10 degrees off course, and the plane does not correct, what are the odds we get to Cabo? Well, I hope it course corrects to Naples, Italy, but keep going. There you go. This is what happens in our lives. We set our goals looking forward and a slight deviation over the course of the year, over five years, 10 years, 20 years, leads to a massively different destination. And what we've learned from Gary is goal set to the now. Imagine what extraordinary looks like someday from now. You get to qualify what that means. For me, it's 20 years. And imagine that life and look backwards and go, okay, great. If this is where I need to be someday, where do I need to be in five years to be on track? And based on that, where do I need to be in the next year to be on track for my five? Once you have clarity on your year, then you start to pick up some momentum because now we can figure out, okay, what do I have to accomplish this month to be on track for my year? And if that's the case, what do I got to knock down this week to be on track for my month? Which means what do I need to focus on today? What do I need to focus on now? Goal setting to the now. Beautifully said, what you're really doing is you're teaching the art and science, not of forecasting, but of backcasting, right? If, you, if your someday goal is to own um, a vacation cabin in Denver, Colorado, you're really saying, what do I need to do 
not just in the next five years, next year, next month, next week, next day, but right now. Like, get off this sofa, and what can I do right now to start that goal? Jeff, thank you for the illustration. It has had a profound impact on me, this concept of goal setting to the now. To quote one of Franklin Covey's co-authors, Chris McChesney, he co-wrote the book, The Four Disciplines of Execution. He says, you know, there will always be more great ideas than there is capacity to execute mm. them. It's why the One Thing book has sold, I think, just shy of two million copies. It is in every airport bookstore in America for perhaps the last decade. Uh, it's a phenomenal book. Highly recommend it. Check out uh, Jeff's podcast as well, The One Thing. Jeff, let's pivot now to goal setting for personal um, personal accountability, for personal realization. Yesterday, you and I were talking about today's conversation. You said something that I thought was really wise. I said to you, you know, uh, give me some examples of goal setting for personal lives. You talk about, you know, in marriages. I said, well, what if someone's not married? What if they're widowed? What if they're divorced? What if they're single? You said, well, everybody's doing life with someone else or a collection of someone else's. Talk about what you've learned around the similarities between goal setting professionally and goal setting personally. There are proven principles that we use when we set goals inside our organizations as leaders. We get offsite out of our normal environment. We pull the people together who are influential in where we're going and we cast a vision and we work it backwards and figure out, okay, who owns which piece and how are we going to execute this? All we're doing is taking proven professional practices and applying them to our personal lives. Because the truth is we understand professionally, we do not succeed alone. We succeed through our teams, but we don't then immediately look at our personal lives and ask the question, who do we succeed through? You know, Scott, I succeed through my wife, Amy. I succeed through my partners, Gary and Jay. I succeed through my team. Yet how many people, when they think about their goals for their life, enlist the support of the people they do life with? Most people don't. And they wonder why in some of those most important relationships over time, they may grow apart instead of growing together. And so this is something that we got from my partner, Jay. For over 15 years now, he and his wife, Wendy, have been getting out of their normal environment and setting goals together. Now, two things immediately pop up in someone's mind. One, if you are a goal setter and you have a significant other, your significant other is likely not a goal setter. That's the majority of people. If you both are goal setters, <laughs> good on you. But most people, that's not the case. They go, well, I'm a goal setter. My significant other isn't. How do I do this with them? And then the second thing comes up, which is what happens if we don't have the same goals? And the answer is you don't. You have the goals that matter to you. They'll have the goals that matter to them. You'll have shared goals. But Scott, what's the key to a successful marriage? Making your wife happy? <laughs> That's right. And, and you do that by compromising, right? So it, this is about getting clarity on what matters to me and you having clarity on what matters to them and what matters to both of us that we compromise on. It's not that your goals are the same. It's that you understand what matters so you can support one another. And so this is something that Jay and Wendy have done for 15 plus years people ask them what their framework was. And we eventually realized, holy smokes, we really need to spread this across the world, which ended up becoming the one thing goal setting retreat for couples and individuals. Jay, I'm gonna share a story and I want you to uh, expand on it when I'm done. Eight months ago or so, uh, you and Jay were gracious enough to extend to me kind of a VIP invite to come to one of your sort of uh, marriage, family, goal setting, virtual weekends. It was a two day course. It was, it was the couple's goal setting retreat. That's that was exactly it. what it is, couple's goal setting retreat. And there was a beautiful participant kit and a guidebook and cameo appearances by keynote speakers. It was extraordinary. The one thing that I remember most about this was you were speaking to basically entrepreneurs and leaders within this couple's goal setting retreat. And you said, if your employees can't see their way to financial success, through your organization, they're mm. also going to leave. That you've got to have not just your financial success in mind, you've got to be deliberately thinking about theirs as well, because they want to earn money. They want to visualize their goals. They want to achieve their goals. And this struck me so well, because I have um, a, a company that I own. 
as an entrepreneur. I have about a dozen part-time employees and one full-time employee. And about a week ago, this full-time employee came to me and resigned. Not in a huff, because he was young, has a young wife and a young child, and wants to make more money. And so as a result of him needing to make more money and have better benefits, he needed to leave my company and join a different company. He resigned. Uh, it was traumatic. I felt betrayed. It was, I felt like I was violated. And then I sort of moved out of my own pity party and I put my mindset into his life, what I was like when I was his age. Mm. And I checked my ego. I woke up the next morning. We met for a, qu a quick bite. And I looked at him. I took him by the shoulders and I said, what do I have to do to help you realize your goals? Quite frankly, it was a $10,000 increase. It was a negotiation for him to move to a different state. But I realized that I was violating the principle that you taught me, which was I've got to make sure that he can see his dreams realized within my business. Mm. Now, I don't have an extra $10,000. I'm going to have to find it because he's worth it. But it was, your, it was your understanding that when you're setting goals, they have to, other people have to see themselves realizing their goals within it. Riff on that and take it wherever you want. Sure. No one succeeds alone. And in a professional setting, the reason someone leaves your world is because they wake up one day, realize they can't have everything they want out of life by being inside your world. So they leave. Maybe it's money. Oftentimes it's things that are suffering in their personal world as a byproduct of being in business with you. And the thing that we as leaders have said is we have to take a stand for the whole person. When we make an offer to somebody to join our organization, we are making a commitment that we are going to help them achieve their goals professionally and personally by being inside our world. Otherwise, we do not earn the right to keep them. Now, Scott, you just substitute, substitute our organization for our marriage. The reason someone leaves a marriage is because they wake up one day and realize they can't have everything they want by being in relationship with that person. And the core message I want to deliver here is if you want to be a person who lives an extraordinary life, we do it with others. We were not bred to just live on our own. We are social creatures. We have to start taking a stand for our, the whole person, for their greatness and be that person that's the wind in their sails that says, what are your goals? Tell me, what does an extraordinary life look like? What does an extraordinary career look like? What do extraordinary finances, relationships, spirituality, physical health look like and truly care? And I got to experience this firsthand because when I first joined this organization, Jay gave me the exact same speech. Mm. And I remember we have a framework for holding weekly one-on-ones between a leader and a direct report called a 411. It's a simple way to identify what you need to do each of the four weeks to be on track for your goals for the month, to be on track for your goals for the year, professionally and personally. And I chose to give Jay permission to enter my personal world. It wasn't required, but I gave him that permission. My number one annual goal, Scott, for the year was to get on the same page with my wife about money because we were not on the same page and it was literally tearing us apart. Every week when we sat down, the very first question out of Jay's mouth was, Jeff, how did your Sunday finance meeting go with Amy? Sometimes, Scott, that answer was not good. We didn't earn the right to talk about anything else. And Jay just dove in there and coached me because he understood there was no way I could show up as the best executive, as the best leader, as the best performer professionally if things at home were breaking. And so he took a stand for me there. You fast forward the year, Amy and I got on the same page about money. And as a result of being in business with Gary and Jay, I achieved, I had a net worth goal that I thought I would hopefully achieve over my lifetime. I achieved it by the age of 35 because I was in their world, not out of it. And as a result, what do you think my loyalty is to them? I'll never leave them. Now for you leaders out there, whether you are a leader in an organization, a leader in your marriage, a leader of your children, how many people would say the same thing about you? 
there's no way I would ever leave being in relationship with them because my world gets bigger as a result of being with them. Damn, that's fire. Uh, I'm thinking about my marriage. I'm thinking about my business. I'm thinking about my role as a leader at Franklin Covey. I'm thinking about my friendships. I'm thinking about my brother. Uh, <laughs> how'd you get so smart? Because <laughs> you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and I made it my one thing to surround myself with extraordinary people. Why you don't have a serious radio talk show is beyond me. Maybe that's in the, in the works. Jeff, teach us some practical advice on sure. goal setting. What are the things that people do wrong and people do right that people literally can, after they finish listening to this podcast and buy Master Mentors and a copy of The One Thing can go implement in their lives? Thanks. One, stop setting goals by yourself. I have realized as a high performer, I can set goals and I can apply amazing work ethic and focus and drive to the result. But if I don't involve the people I do life with, I'm always facing a headwind. There's always resistance because the people that I do life with aren't aligned. They're not on board. They're not supporting it. So step one, who are the people that are vital to your success? If you are married, your significant other is one of them. It might be a group of friends. We had a, a group of eight high-powered female attorneys that flew to Austin for this event. Their husbands didn't come, but these powerhouse women, they came because this was the core group that they did life together with. Who are those people? And how do you invite them into the opportunity to set your goals together? Hey, you're important to me. And I'm realizing that I actually don't have clarity on what you want out of life or how I can actually support you getting there. So I would love this year for us to get out of our normal environment, for us to individually cast a vision for our lives and work it backwards to set some goals. And we can share them with one another to understand how we can support each other better than we ever have over the next year. That is that if you could only do one thing, that is it. Jeff, beyond involving those you do life with in goal setting, sure. are there some other consistent things that people tend to get tripped up on yes. when they're thinking about their someday goal and they're struggling with uh, you know, goal setting to the now? Yes. When I said, start by imagining what an extraordinary life looks like someday from now, which for me, that's 20 years. There is a cohort of you who heard that and thought, I have no clue what that would look like. Or if you asked, what does extraordinary look like 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, you will hit a wall called, I don't know. The mistake is to stop searching for the answer. And unfortunately, this is how we were taught in our education system. We were taught to have the answer, not to search for answers we didn't yet have. You have to learn to develop this muscle. I guarantee every single one of you who's listening to this, if you sat down with a pen and a piece of paper and picked one area of your life, say physical health, and imagine what would extraordinary physical health look like in 10, 15, 20 years, and you refused to stop at the wall of I don't know and continued searching, guarantee you will arrive at a set of answers. You've officially broken through the wall that most people stop at, by the way, congratulations. Then you get to look at that list and say, all right, not everything on this list matters equally. What are the handful of goals, the 20% goals that would drive 80% plus of the value in my life? You get clarity on those vital few. Then you start goal setting to the now. Well, where would I need to be in five years to be on track for my someday? By the way, most people will think, I don't know. You continue searching, guaranteed you will come up with an answer. Then when you go, great, well, where do I need to be in the next year to be on track for my five? All of a sudden, you're going to start to feel, you're like, okay, I can do this. I can do this because the closer it gets today, the more in control it feels. So to, to, to articulate, the opportunity is to push past the wall of I don't know and search for answers. That is a massively powerful skill. People, I'm telling you, page 150, 
by the one thing, it will change your life. Jay, you are personal friends with Gary Keller. You are business partners with him. He, of course, one of the co-founders of the real estate firm Keller Williams, the largest real estate company now globally, uh, self-made billionaire. I've watched many of his YouTube videos and a lot of his social posts to kind of glean some of his disciplines and insights. What are a few of the replicable lessons that you've learned from Gary that every one of us could execute on in our own careers, in our own marriages, our own lives? When I was interviewing for this opportunity, I flew to Austin, I had dinner with Jay and Wendy, and I asked them the question, what's been the biggest gift you've gotten being in business with Gary? And Jay looked at me and said, Jeff, no question, it's thinking bigger. I didn't understand what that meant until I got experience with Gary. He has an amazing ability to ask surprisingly simple questions that when they come off his tongue, you're like, oh yeah, that, that sounds like nothing. But then it hits you and you go, holy smokes. Like I remember being asked, what's the business that'll put you out of business? And how can you build it first? Repeat that, because that is profound. I've written a blog about that. Repeat that quote. <laughs> yeah. What's the business that will put you out of business? And how can you build it first? So it's, it's little moments like that where he asks these questions that are, are so simple. They're not long-winded questions. They're simple. They're to the point. But they make you stop and go, huh, great question. Or I remember with one of our other partners, he asked him to do it to do a, a pro forma for what the business could, could become. And he put all this math together to get to a hundred million. And Gary just looked at him and said, why'd you stop at a hundred? Now I want you to come back with a pro forma to get to a billion. Something that's so simple, but makes you just go, whew, okay, I've been thinking too small. And so that's been the gift is recognizing where I have artificially placed ceilings over my achievement and being in relationship with people who make statements or more importantly, ask questions that challenge you to shatter that ceiling and go way out. And the thing is, it's valid because Gary's done it. Jeff, perhaps finally, one of the principles that our co-founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey taught that permeates our culture and I hope permeates my life is having an abundance mentality. Franklin Covey is a very abundant company and today, I'd like you to talk a bit about uh, what your organization does in terms of helping other organizations, families, spouses set goals. Talk a little bit about the services you provide in case somebody is in the market for that. Thank you. Well, time is our most valuable resource. And every team feels like they have too much to do and not enough time. The problem is they're spending their time. They're not investing it. They do not wake up and view their time as the most valuable resource, invest it and hold it accountable to delivering a return professionally and personally. And that's what we do. We have a really simple approach to help leaders transform teams from busy to productive so that they achieve the most important things professionally and personally. And for those of you, if you're leaders in companies, we're happy to engage with you, but for specific to this topic, we're talking about not just having an extraordinary career, we're talking about having an extraordinary life and involving the people you do life with. So our website is theonething.com. That's with the number one in the URL. At the top, you'll see some options, grow yourself. You can learn about our One Thing Goal Setting Retreat for couples and individuals. It's happening this November, November 13th and 14th. Virtually based event, we'll have VIP in person and grow your business. You can learn about how we help businesses grow. Uh, with any luck, my wife, Stephanie, and I will be back for round number two on that. Jeff Woods, the host of the wildly successful and broadly distributed podcast, The One Thing, and the co-founder and president of the company that supports the book written by Keller and Papasan. Jay, or, uh, Jeff, rather, thank you for joining us today. Delighted to shine our spotlight on you. Great success to you. It's my pleasure, Scott. Thank you. You know, I don't know if you caught that, but uh, Jeff is one of the most well-spoken people I've met. If you look at the deliberation with which he chooses his words, the, the pause, the cadence to create impact on what he said, there's a lot to be learned from today's interview with Jeff, including how we are 
uh, representatives of what we teach, right? Are you a light or are you a judge? Are you a model? Or are you a critic? And I think Jeff shows a lot of great leadership traits in terms of not just what a powerful communicator he is, but also the vulnerability of sharing some of the mistakes he's made in his marriage and his career and how he chose to stand up when everybody else sat down. When will you choose to stand up? Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of On Leadership.